Hey, what's up guys? What's up, Howard? Good evening, good to see you. Welcome back. We are covering the Milk Shark. Rise up here on, on Acutus tonight. D Sir Douglas Bane, what's up? Welcome back. I hope you guys had a good weekend. Uh, mine, mine was pretty chill. Um, and I don't know, it's gonna be, this is gonna be an interesting night. I don't know if you can hear it, but like, I definitely have um, allergies and it's, it's really, it's really, uh, it's, it's been pretty bad actually. So um, my voice, uh, my voice might sound kind of scratchy or <clears throat> my throat is definitely really scratchy. So we're going to push on with this shark and we'll see how far we get. Um, but like uh, this, this weekend has been quite the struggle. Uh, just yeah, it's been it's been it it's not been fun days. Uh, allergies like I, I usually don't get like fall allergies, but, like spring allergies. I sometimes do, sometimes don't. But for some reason, this year has been kind of rough. Hey, Minjus, what's up? Welcome back. So uh, yeah, so it's gonna be an interesting interesting night. Um, I hope we can make it to eleven, but uh, you know, just just we'll see how far we can go. Uh, oh, thank you. Yeah, uh, right. Yeah, everybody seems to be getting allergies or sick right now. Yeah, like, uh, I feel like it's all happening at once, which is really funny. So, um, so I've got this, like, raspy smoker's voice <laughs> for tonight, but we'll see, we'll see what we can do with it. Um, but I'm excited about this shark, because I virtually know nothing about the milk shark. I know, um, well, clearly we have Rise of Crown on Terra Novi, which is the Atlantic shark for the shark. Uh, that's actually the first shark I've ever handled, um, in terms of, like, you know, doing a shark survey and shark tagging. So I've handled cousins of this shark, um, but I haven't like met this particular shark specifically. And then there's uh, Resipion on Perosis, which is the Caribbean sharpnose shark. Um, Roy, Roy, welcome back! Oh man, everybody's here. This is awesome. Oh, thank you, Minjus. I appreciate that a lot. Thank you. I hope I hope the raspiness isn't too like I I it's I don't know if I'm just hearing it in my head or if it's coming through, but I hope it's not distracting. Um, I hope we have. Nice audio quality, so, and I apologize in advance if my voice is just really raspy. Um, you know, just allergies are not fun, so. Um, we've got, uh, I'm kind of in a new location, uh, which is kind of fun too. Uh, it's still in the Chesapeake Bay region, but uh, you, know, you might have been noticing that the setup has been a little different. I've hung up, um, I've had this poster for a while, but this is kind of like my, you know, fun um, shark poster. So I have the, uh, bull shark uh, to my, I don't know if I could do directions correctly, to my left, uh, which is, actually no, that's left on the screen. So bull shark over here, uh, sandbar shark over here. We've got a sand tiger, uh, the top, and then a dusky shark uh, on the top as well. So top left is sand tiger, top right is dusky shark. So um, so I'm setting up kind of like a new, a new little lab uh, in the Chesapeake region. I'm still in the Chesapeake Bay my home region, but like, uh, I don't know, just having fun, uh, kind of playing with some new setups, so, but man, hope you guys had a good weekend, please leave a comment, um, oh yeah, th thanks Minjus, yeah, I've had this, I've had this background for a while, I've never used it on the stream, but I've used it at like book signings, or like, like events, like lectures and stuff, so, uh, but thank you, yeah, I, 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 this is, this, this has been with me for, um, it's never been on the stream, but it's been with me for a while, so, but, uh, hope you guys had a good weekend, please leave a comment, if you guys did anything exciting, um, I just, I just pretty much took it easy this weekend, so nothing too crazy. I just took it easy and got allergies, but, um, and like, uh, yeah, pr pr pretty chill weekend for the most part, but, uh, hope you guys all had good weekends. Um, Milk Shark is going to be interesting because, uh, we don't have any footage on this species. Like, the there are clips on YouTube, but it's really about, like, fishing for them and like cleaning them and it's like yeah, I, I don't want to show that um this is a very and it makes sense because it's a very commercially like um what's the word like it, it's active in a lot of commercial fisheries and i think it's a really good subject of um fisheries uh, management uh just for that reason there is uh even though there's not a lot of video there's a lot of literature on the milk shark. Uh, we have got a lot of cool papers, um, a lot of cool studies uh, to kind of go through. Plus we got a lot of cool like profiles, like uh, kind of general, um, e easy, e more easily digestible profiles on the species. So we get to kind of learn what it's about. Uh, so I'm excited about this. Um, so yeah, let's dive in. Firstly, thank you Howard for your awesome art. Uh, my favorite feature and something I'm noticing about this species is in, in particular, is I love, it, it's a little subtle, but I love how you captured kind of the um, the V shape on the side, like these, um, 
uh, vertical, uh, vertical, yeah, uh, <laughs> vertical, um, vertical kind of V-shaped bars um, on the side of the body, and they're very faint, very light in um, you know actual milk sharks. But it is something I'm noticing, and that I'm pretty sure sharpnose sharks don't have, like shark, like like Atlantic sharpnose sharks or Caribbean sharpnose sharks, uh, sharpnose sharks. They don't really have this kind of um, like faint pattern. And I'm wondering if this is a kind of a, a distinguishing feature of the milk shark, because the few photographs um, I've been able to see of individuals um, have that kind of pattern. And it reminds me vaguely of like how angel sharks, like the classic angel shark, Squatina Squatina, have like a light uh, rippling pattern. So uh, really cool, really cool uh, touch on this piece of art. And I love that uh, you have the Indonesian uh, snapper, Lejanus bitaniatus. Yep. Um, uh, included here, so cool prey item for the milk shark. I also love that it's in a shallow coastal environment. So this is a shallow water shark species. Uh, like we talked about with the Atlantic sharpnose shark, um, usually small coastal sharks, it, it, dep it depends on the species, but the Atlantic sharpnose shark is doing very, very well conservation-wise. This one, I'm pretty sure, is vulnerable, but um, I'm, I'm curious to learn more about it as far as like why these two, like the Atlantic sharpnose shark and the milk shark, could be two very similar species, but um, have varying levels of success. And I wonder, I'm curious as we go into the breakdown, um, if there's specific differences between those species as far as like why the Atlantic sharpnose shark is doing well and the milk shark is, you know, not endangered, but it's not doing as well. So, um, oh, nice. I just hope you had a great, uh, or uh, it's nice to see you had a chill weekend as well. Um, <laughs> and thank you, even though I got allergies. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, um, I'm excited because uh, right now this is the, so we're entering into late April and this is the very beginning of the summertime sharks coming back into the Chesapeake Bay and like the like kind of like the Virginian Mid-Atlantic region. So uh, the first one that comes back usually is the uh, Dusky Smoothhound, Muscles Canis. So it's just starting to come into the bay. Um, so a lot of our cold water sharks, like the dogfish and baskin sharks, and baskin sharks are just really, really rare. But, um, but like kind of more like the New Englandy sharks, um, they're starting to leave my like the region I'm in, and they're actually actually minges are heading up to you now, which is kind of fun because um, I believe you're in New England, if I remember correctly. So um, it's really cool to see that a lot of the New England fauna, um, or the the fauna that I, I I think of as like you know cold water uh, fauna. They're here kind of in the mid-Atlantic for the winter and then they start going back up to New England in the summer. And then conversely, a lot of warm water fauna, which I, I like to call them like Florida sharks, you know, because uh, like Florida is like a stronghold for a lot of shark species year round. And then they'll just move up north, you know, like um, in the summer. So bull sharks, great example, like bull sharks live year round in Florida, um, but then they'll sometimes go north, oh, not sometimes, kind of often go north during the warm season and then come back down to Florida um, or just stay in Florida um, for like the winter season. But anyway, so right now we're getting the warm water sharks. So the, Flor the Florida sharks are starting to come up here. The most famous migration is the black tip shark migration. So those famous Florida black tips, um, like in Blue Planet, um, where they're migrating, it includes the mid-Atlantic region of the United States, which is kind of cool. So, um, oh yeah, uh, oh exciting! More sharks for me. I love that comment. Uh, oh, <laughs> yeah. It's funny. Um, I just saw your comment. Florida wasn't so Florida. I love to live there for the wildlife. I. It's funny because I. I don't know if I mentioned this on stream. I used to live in Florida uh, for a year. Um, I was in the Tampa Bay region, and uh, it was funny. Like. My time in Florida, for me, so the wildlife opportunities were amazing. I will say that, like, there, there was a, so much wildlife um, and so much you could do as far as, like, you could snorkel in seagrass, you can be in, like, palmetto forests, um, like, there's alligators everywhere, there's uh, roseate spoonbills, um, which are this beautiful bird. So many birds that I think, that I come to think of as rare, like night herons and things, they're in Florida. Um, sharks would wash up on the beach, like there's manatees, like it, it, ecologically incredible place. Like Florida is an incredible place. Um, our, our friend, uh, Dr. Connor McDonald, um, you know, is, is in Florida and, and he, he does a lot of cool work there. So it's like ecologically, Florida is an incredible place. Um, research wise, very important state for uh, shark research. There's a lot of great uh, universities um, 
and places uh, in Florida. And like also, it's a very there's areas in Florida that are very conservation minded. So, um, and, and and in fact, more so. I I mean, I love Virginia, but like I have to kind of tip my hat to Florida a little bit as far as like there's beach towns that are very very like. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I have I have a, I just saw your comment. Uh, I have a butt though. Um, so there's beach towns that you know like are very eco-friendly or eco-minded as far as like they don't use plastic straws uh they are very very conscious of like sea turtle nesting and and um sea or seabirds so it's like in that sense like that side of florida bucks like the reputation like that side of florida i think is worth you know like it, like it's worth mentioning that there, there's that part of florida that's really good um the other side of florida uh, which is probably what you guys are referring to in the comments um, I, I'll add to that in saying uh, Florida is very crowded. Um, like there's so many roads and so many highways that just intersect, and that was one thing that I really didn't like about it, which was just like it's just there's there's so that you can't really it's hard to find like a quiet place, you know. It's just like like and, and because it's like a flat you know it's a flat uh, peninsula, you know it's so easy to make roads kind of crisscross. So it's just like. Um, it, it, there's a lot of traffic everywhere, and there's a lot of, like, conge uh, not traffic, but, or, not, like, it, it's, it's not, like, super crazy, but it's, like, it, 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 it's hard, it was hard to find, like, a quiet place, where it's, like, I'm used to in Virginia, um, Virginia's geography is such that there are separate peninsulas that are just not developed, because you have Washington, Richmond, and Hampton Roads, and then there's no reason to, like, you know, make major cities elsewhere, so it's just, like, you know, Virginia is actually a lot more quiet places and a lot more like places I feel like I could be on the beach and just chill by myself, you know. Um, and like Florida, uh, just so much, so, so much population, um, a lot of crowdedness. Um, the big thing for me too was that there were no, there wasn't really any seasons. There was like the wet season and dry season because it's a tropical place. Um, and I really missed temperate places. Like I love seasonality. I love like. You know, you get to be in the ocean in the summer, and then, you know, fall comes in, and then you get to enjoy the winter with snow and, like, the holidays. So it's like, I love that cycle, and it didn't really happen in Florida. And plus, spring break or, like, major holidays in Florida get crazy, but especially spring break get crazy. Like, like, I, 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 that was the closest I've ever seen to the apocalypse, which was, like, just, like... Because I, I lived I lived on an island in Florida and like uh, it, it just like exploded in population during the spring break break season and I I, I, I used to go to this beach cafe and I, I couldn't get to it because it, it was just back to back traffic so um, so yeah it, it has hit some misses and I just wanted to say that um, ultimately just to give Florida some like positive notes because like again ecologically amazing place and there's a lot of great research and researchers and, and universities and institutions in florida like Mo marine lab is a famous one um university of florida and gainesville um really important so but like also you know there's aspects of it that deserve the reputation so <laughs> like so it's, it's hit and miss every place has like a trade-off so sorry i went down that road and i, I uh want to make sure i catch up on the comments so uh, however, Florida and the Carolinas are awesome. I, I would say I would say they're similar in that way, where it's like, um, and I would say actually the Carolinas are a bit quieter, which is nice. So um, there's some really great places on the um, South Carolina has Fripp Island and uh, Hunting Island. Uh, North Carolina has Baldhead Island. These are amazing places for like sharks and um, just really cool places where you can still get that kind of tropical vibe. Um, and because there's subtropical areas uh, with alligators and palmettos, and it's pretty cool. So, uh, Howard, love St. Augustine and Venice Beach. Yes, Venice Beach, amazing place for shark teeth, incredible. So, uh, Howard, I'm tired of snow. Yes, so I, I, I think part of the reason I talk positively about snow is because I don't really get a lot of it. So, uh, <laughs> oh, I just want to go to Carolina just to work at Carowinds. What is Carowinds? I, I, and like, I, I probably should know that, but, um, I haven't heard it. Is that like a resort area or is that uh, a like, let, let me know what that is. I'm so curious about that. So, um, and it's kind of funny, like uh, kind of tying it in a weird way, tying it back to the milk shark, hilariously enough. Um, all these places that we're talking about, so uh, Florida, the Carolinas, um, those are really, really hot sharp-nosed shark habitats. And this is a cousin to, or this is a kind of sharp-nosed shark 
Um, so cousin to the uh, Atlantic Sharpto Shark. So let's take a look at what the Milk Shark is. And I'll, I'll um, ch check back in the comments, but this is one, th there's a lot of different, there's a couple of different photos I could find of it. It's hard to find photos of the species in life or in its natural habitat. But um, as far as like uh, fisheries photos, uh, this one I really like because this is a pretty fresh specimen. And uh, just some preliminary observations. This guy, so you can clearly see why it's called a sharp nose shark because it has a very elongated snout. It almost kind of reminds uh, you of like a, a blue shark, you know, because um, like blue sharks also proportionally have a very uh, elongated snout. But as far as sharp nose sharks goes, uh, I would say the milk shark, so this species, kind of has a little bit of a pointier snout than the one that I'm used to, the Atlantic sharp nose shark. Um, you can clearly see the Ampullae Lorenzini right behind the head. A uh, beautiful giant green eye, so very, very lovely eye. Um, so, and again, I, I always love shark eyes. I think, you know, there's just so much energy behind them. Um, there's so much, there's so, they're, they're just seeing the, a shark's eye in life is just like, there's, there's just so much intensity behind them. It's, it's so beautiful. Um, it's very small, very, very small mouth, uh, which is kind of funny uh, seeing proportionally like, the larger snout, but then, um, uh, and the huge eye, but then proportionally it's kind of like a smaller mouth. Uh, pretty small gill slits too, uh, relative to the body size. Let's, let's see, in life, in life it can't see really features, features I was talking about. There's other, there's other photos with uh, like the blur of the bird right Let's see, let's see. Let's see. I had to find a couple other photos up. Um, that's fine, that's fine, I don't see, see, see it. All sharks, sharks can kind of see, see it, so, so I think I think I think I heard the second section. All sharks, all sharks, if, all sharks, sharks, if I'm doing that correctly, all sharks, all sharks, fish, and actually really all vertebrates technically have a segmentation where you have that kind of like that series of. This is not an appropriate term, but like like ribs, you know, like like just like like a series of like they're basically a series of blocks of muscle. Uh, let's see if I can find a clearer photograph um, of that. But I, I do kind of want to see as we learn more about the sharp nose shark if, like, you know, prominent marking, like segmentation markings, or something that kind of helps identify the species. Uh, let's see. There was a really good photograph I saw earlier. And these are, these are all the milk shark. Um, so these are all Riser prionodon acutus. Oh, uh, Roy, just saw your comment. Uh, Carowinds is a uh, theme park by the Carolina uh, Brothers. Oh, Howard, the biggest med teeth come from North Carolina or Chile. Yeah, so North Carolina, um, like, I, there, what is that famous place? Oh, oh my gosh. I'm sorry, my brain is not fully functioning. It's, um, I should, is it Aurora, North Carolina? There, there is a very famous fossil site in North Carolina, like a really, really famous fossil site, like a world famous fossil site. I can't remember what it is, so. Um, oh, uh, Minjus, I feel like their eyes could be uh, compared to squid eyes in terms of intensity, if that makes sense. Yeah, actually, it does. Um, and it's kind of cool because... Um, oh, cool. Uh, Aurora, okay, awesome, Aurora. Uh, and Howard, I just saw your uh, comment. Um, I see that muscle pattern in all, in all sharks anytime they contract it or swim. Awesome, so yeah. So yeah, it is, it is, I think segmentation is the right term, but like body segmentation, so it's just like, like all sharks have it. Um, I, I think in life, this species, there's some prominent markings associated with it, but um, but all sharks do have it. You're absolutely right that all sharks do have it. Um, and it's kind of an interesting, when you stop to think about it, it's kind of an interesting concept applied to a lot of vertebrates, um, I mean, even, I mean, like, or pretty much all vertebrates, because when you think about it, all vertebrates are segmented in a way where it's like you have the segments of the vertebral column, you know, the segments of like muscle associated with that. So it's interesting. Um, but anyway, uh, as far as squid eyes go, it's really interesting. Uh, that's an interesting comparison, and just because uh, like cephalopods, like squid or octopus, you know, they're intelligent, they're intelligent animals, and sharks, like, I feel like they're. They, ha they have an intensity and awareness that is like, they may not be like, 
as cerebral per se as um, or like like whales or maybe even cephalopods, but they have such highly developed senses in in dimensions that we just can't even perceive. That it's just like I feel like they're kind of like a different kind of intelligence for me. Like like they're kind of like this like the most finely tuned, like plugged in, like just just they're, they're sensing a world that we don't really like we can't really quite tap into and it's just so cool so i, I like that comparison like those of, of those two different groups so um but um but yeah but also uh, yeah i thought i thought it was aurora because every time i look at uh for the fossil site because every time i look at um places to compare my fossils um as far as um just just an identification um you know i i usually run into aurora because i think that formation in north carolina is very similar to the virginia formations which makes sense which totally makes sense uh ge ge geologically and geographically totally makes sense so um yeah so just a couple more photos this is actually a really nice one of a milk shark in life this individual it, it could be biased from like the angle and like the um mouth being distended but um the sound in this individual actually looks a little bit shorter so a uh, nice little set of sharp teeth um this is not really the way so when i used to work up sharp new sharks um i would hold it from uh beneath the jaw and have kind of a firm grip underneath the jaw um so it's like like it's correct that to hold a shark you really should be holding it by um kind of the midsection of the body like its head uh like you should have a grip on its head and um another section of the body um and it's specifically is because again it's like sharks are pure muscle they're very very flexible and uh you can't if you're working a shark up you cannot hold it just by the tail because it will rear up and bite you um and it's happened to a colleague of mine where she was working up a lemon shark and she she took her hand off the head and it rose up and bit her so you do have to have your hand on the head to make sure that um you know you have control over like the bitey bits um and then also you you really shouldn't hold a shark by its tail because um because the shark is pure muscle and because the shark is like it doesn't have that bony skeletal structure like uh, like other fish um it actually hurts the shark if you hold it by a tail or lift it up by the tail especially a large shark, um, it, it, it starts just tearing up muscle inside. So it's, it, it's, it's, a really, it's really harmful for a shark to hold it up by the tail. You really should be holding it, um, you know, by the head uh, or, or like kind of more back of the body. So it's a nice individual, um, like, you know, be beautiful little shark, actually. It's really cool to see sharp nose sharks because they're like, you know, they're like compact, uh, carcharinids. They're, they're, these are cousins to like the sandbar sharks and bull sharks, but like they're so much smaller. Uh, they're really, they're actually fun entry level sharks to work on. So very, very cool. Uh, beautiful male. Um, and it's kind of cool to see the claspers uh, on this uh, individual are pretty, they seem pretty well developed actually. So this actually might be a mature male despite the small size. Uh, so it's kind of cool to see like how this might be this is like kind of more of like a small small species altogether so but uh yes yeah, Roy, Roy, i just saw your comment um the gill grab yeah so that's not a good practice because the gills are that that's a really good comment because the gills are fragile um so uh that's that's the way this particular uh individual is holding this shark is not correct because um that the gills are sensitive and it is like hurting the shark so you really should be cupping kind of like the lower jaw um, and like holding that tightly just to make sure that like the, the shark is, does not open its mouth. So, you know, but oh, I love, I love these comments. Uh, Howard and Minjus, like, like more sensory and physical intelligence. Yeah, very, yeah, I, I just like, I, I love our group guys because it's like we, we really, I feel like we're on the same page as far as just like. I don't know, some, some of that kind of ethereal value that sharks bring that it's just it's hard to put into words and it's not scientific like there's something just powerful about sharks that you can't really quantify so like about all sharks so just love that so um but uh yeah let's check out florida museum natural history i was actually pleasantly surprised to see that there was a 
Florida Museum of Natural History profile on the milk shark because I don't think the milk shark is a North American species and um, Florida Museum usually covers North American species for the most part, but uh, let's check it out. So I'm just gonna take a drink of water. Hmm. Let's see. It is an abundant, so milk shark, uh, Rhizoprenodon acutus. It is an abundant inshore shark that is popular for subsistence and commercial fishing. Despite its preference for estuaries and surf zones, it is considered harmless to humans because of its size and teeth. Of course, yeah, of course it's harmless. I, I, I would give, I'll, I think I said this last week too, I, we'll give Florida Museum a hall pass whenever it talks about sharks being dangerous just because they have the shark attack file on this website. So, let's see. Oh, interesting. Lots of English names. We've got milk shark, fish shark, which is ridiculous, gray dog shark, gray dog shark, long men's dog shark, milk dog shark, milk shark, like milkshake, it's really funny, sharp nose shark, sharp nose milk shark, and white eye shark. So, kind of odd names for this. And I, I am so curious, like, will we find out tonight the mystery of, like, why in the world is this called a milk shark? So, let's see. Excuse me. Uh, it's commonly taken in subsistence, artisanal, and commercial fisheries throughout its range. Also taken as game fish and recreational fisheries. It's a nice photo of the species. Again, this one has a very pointy snout uh, compared to... Uh, I feel like that's kind of, Well, I guess that's in line with other Rhizoprionodon, so... Um, it is sometimes utilized for fins and meat, but is re of relatively little importance due to its small size. Let's see. As an abundant inshore shark species, the milk shark is commonly caught in subsistence, artisanal, and commercial fisheries throughout its range. It is one of the most commonly taken shark species off the waters of northern Australia. Okay. Uh, fortunately, this has not affected the milk shark populations adversely in this area. The milk shark is commonly taken in gillnet and trawl fisheries in waters off of India, uh, India, where some assessment populations have been attempted, primarily in the 80s and 90s. Although results showed this species was being underexploited, the methods used for this assessment were questionable. Since this time, the Adelaide Asberg catches have increased dramatically in this region, and it's likely that the species is becoming more heavily exploited. Let's see. So, distribution. This is kind of cool. So this is the most widely ranged sharp nose shark in the world. So the Atlantic sharp nose shark um, is... I think it is just in North America, and Caribbean shark nose shark just in um, w the western central Atlantic. But the milk shark is in the eastern Atlantic, um, the Indian Ocean, uh, Indo-Pacific, um, northern Australia, uh, east coast of Asia, uh, southern Japan. So it's a pretty large range, actually, uh, which is pretty wild for such a small species. Right. Residing on continental shelves in close proximity to sandy beaches and sometimes reported in estuaries, the milk shark occurs close to the surface in shallow waters to depths of 200 meters. So it's exclusively a sunlit zone shark. It has been reported to enter freshwater habitats, including several instances in Cambodia. Interesting. So that's actually really cool. Uh, bull sharks do enter um, Cambodian rivers, um, which is kind of fun. So. It's interesting to see these two species might interact, um, probably in a predatory way, but... Let's see... The milk shark is small, with narrow snout, large eyes... Uh, this mouth has long labial folds at the corners that distinguish the species from other requiem sharks. So let's see if we can get a diagram of that... Okay. So when they say labial folds, they mean, um... This right here, I don't know how well that shows up, but, um, so, like, it, it's this, it's this line around, uh, the upper jaw. Let's see. Uh, uh the first was fin, which was fin, two, no interdorsal ridge. Okay, coloration. This is what I wanted to know. Uh, fins of the milk shark are slightly darker than the body color. Okay, so I guess that segmentation... I thought there was a photo in life of the segmentation being more prominent, but I guess it's not something that kind of helps distinguish it, but... 
Um, okay. Uh, teeth are similar in both upper and lower jaws. Uh, juvenile milk sharks have oblique, narrowly triangular, smooth edged teeth, while the teeth of an adult milk shark are finely serrated. So that's actually really cool. So this is, um, uh, uh, I forget the proper phrase for it. Is it like ontogenetic heterodonty? Um, I forget the right word for that, but it's basically like the teeth change as the sharks grow, um, which is cool. We've seen a few species recently that do that, where the pups will have a different tooth type, and then as they grow into adults, um, the, the teeth morph into something else. So it's really cool to see. So. Um, for juveniles and adults, like the serration, I mean, the serrations, I guess, suggests that maybe the adult milk shark um, is more of a generalist predator and uh, the uh, juvenile milk sharks are more specialized, but could be wrong about that. But uh, maximum reported age is eight years. Maximum length is 1.75 meters or 5.7 feet. Let's see. Oh, prey items. Let's see what that is. Oh, this is a great. This is a great photo. Perfect. This is a great photo of labial folds. So, um, so kind of a, see how the corners of the mouth. There's just this like it makes this like indentation um, that is pretty prominent. This is what they mean by the labial fold. It is it is pretty long, um, but this is such a subtle feature that. Um, that would be very hard to diagnose, like, in life. Like, imagine if you're underwater, uh, you're probably not going to catch this feature, really. Um, so, this is, this is a feature that is helpful for classifying the species after it's captured, but as far as in life, that's not really a helpful feature. So, um, really cool view of the Ampullae Lorenzini, particularly, look at this. Um, on the upper jaw, there's actually a nice collection of Ampullae Lorenzini right near the lip, which is kind of wild. Uh, I don't know if we've seen that before in sharks. Because you have the collection, like the classic collection of Ampullae Lorenzini near the snout, right? But then you have like an actual perfect, um, like matching uh, semicircle of Ampullae Lorenzini in line with the upper jaw. So that's actually a cool feature. I've never, I don't think I've seen that before. And it's something where it's like, I don't know if that's unique to the milk shark or if that's something that many sharks have and that we just haven't noticed that before, but it's pretty cool. So Ampullae and Lorenzini, again, are the electro-sensing organs. So these are help, uh, these are what help sharks sense um, hidden prey items or anything that gives off an electric field. Let's see. I love this sentence. Sharks primarily primarily use this sense to locate cryptic prey, which cannot be detected by their other senses, such as stingrays buried in the sand. That's really cool. Let's see. <laughs> love these comments, guys. Sorry, I was just uh, reading this, so... Imagine having electroreceptors on your lips. Pretty, pretty cool feature. And like when you think about it, um, might be helpful for like if the shark is in like est like very cloudy estuarying environments. Um, could be helpful if it's cruising on a bottom and uh, it senses a prey item. It, like kind of hones in on like a final detection, then snaps it up. So uh, pretty, pretty interesting. Let's see, uh, reproduction milk shark is viviparous with yolk sac placenta. So, my guess for why this is called a milk shark is something to do with reproduction. It's something to do, that, that is my guess in terms of why in the world it's called a milk shark. But I could be absolutely wrong. It could be something completely different. But, like, I'm gonna guess it's something to do with um, just because it's a live bearing shark, I feel like there's like some weird association with that. So I could be totally wrong, but that's my guess as far as like why in the world this is called a milk shark. Um, Indian South African population gives birth during the months of January and February, following a one year gestation period. Mature females give birth every year. Uh, the number of pups in each litter is correlated with the size of the female. Interesting. So litters contain one to six pups, each of which measures. Uh, well, they're very small, like about um, uh, 
10 to 15 inches or 25 to 39 centimeters at birth. So those are really tiny. Uh, predators. Oh, this is this is a cool callback to last week. The black tip shark, uh, Carcharis lumbatus, and the Australian black tip shark, Carcharis tilt stony, are known predators of, the, predators of the milk shark. Other potential predators include large marine mammals and large fish, including other sharks. So very cool. All right. Oh, look at this. Oh, okay. Here's the origin of the name. Here we go. So I'm not. Wait, I'm not really correct. Here we go. This shark is commonly referred to as the milk shark because in some regions it is believed that eating the flesh of this shark will improve the milk production of a human mother. It is the most widely distributed shark in the genus Rhizoproudon. So uh, that's kind of wild. Um, I'm curious which regions started that belief um, and that's kind of fascinating, actually, uh, but that's also kind of not a great English name uh, because that's based on something that's human-centric and that's not really based on something that is, like, helpful for identifying the shark. Like, Greenland shark, for example, it's helpful because it's like, okay, it's a shark that's associated with Greenland or you can find it in Greenland, you know, so it's just like... Yeah, kind of an odd name for the species. Let's see, Riza Prioridon. Riza means root, Prion means saw, and Odo 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 Oduus means teeth. Um, Acutus, doesn't say where Acutus comes from, but Fishbase will have that, so. Well, we found out why it's called a milk shark though, but um, that, that was not what I was expecting. Let me uh, <laughs> look at the comments. Oh my gosh, yep. So, that is wild, yep. So, so that's, I, I don't think we've ever seen a name like that. Um, yeah, because it's, it's not descriptive, it's based on a belief of something. So, that's, that's really fascinating, actually. Um, let's check out fish base as far as acutus. Acutus, Latin for sharp or pointed, refer probably referring to the narrow pointed snout. Um, and then Rhizocrondon, it mean, it's referring to the teeth of serrated bases or roots. Interesting. So Let's check out some photos of the milk shark. Oh, good. We got quite a few, actually. So here we go. All right, so this is a cute little guy, cute little individual. Uh, really nice dorsal foot, actually. So this is a, this is a beautiful, like, miniature carcharinid. Um, really great example of, like, kind of the whole family, I would say. You know, as far as, like, you get the classic basic features of what makes a carcharinid a carcharinid a carcharinid. Um, just like that classic Requiem shark build. Also, my, my throat is really scratchy, so I'm um, just... Heads up, probably going to be drinking a lot of water, so just apologies in advance for that. But um, This is a preserved specimen, but really nice individual. Um, uh, you can see that's an adult male. It's kind of cool to compare these two photos where you, you clearly can see a size difference. Even though there's not like a point of reference, you can tell just by the body shape that this is like a beefier individual. This is an individual that's been, you know, more, more well fed, um, just achieving a larger size. Um, this individual, the eye is like so, it's so small, like the eye is like so proportionally large um, compared to the rest of the body. The fins look a little bit thinner, you know, so. But the biggest thing is for this male, um, you can definitely see more prominent claspers. So, um, so usually for juvenile sharks, for juvenile male sharks, um, I kind of feel like a general idea is like underdeveloped claspers are very small and they're kind of in line with the length of the pelvic fins. So they're kind of like you, typically as long as the pelvic fins. But for large, for mature males, like sexually mature males, uh, claspers extend past the pelvic fins. They're very full. They're very like large. You can, you, you can kind of just tell by, by the shape in size that that's a mature male individual shark. So um, this is a slightly damaged individual. Um, and even though uh, the coloration is not that good, you can see clearly like that segmentation we were talking about earlier. Ooh, that's actually a really beautiful shark. Uh, shark. 
Beautiful shot. Uh, look at that bronzy color. Really, really nice looking individual. Like dark bronzy above uh, with this nice creamy white below. It's actually a great looking shark. Like color wise, it almost makes you think of like a dusky shark or a bronze whale or, you know, uh, really, really uh, nice coloration on that. Um, another preserved specimen of the milk shark. This one is a adult female. Uh, not as great uh, preserved specimen. This one looks like a little bit smaller. Uh, this one is kind of fascinating. We'll have to put a pin in this because look at that fin. The fin has an extremely prominent black tip to the point where you have to wonder, is that the same species? Is that like a genetic defect or is that like, you know, is there something behind that? Um, so let, let's keep an eye on this uh, as we go through some of the literature tonight. Um, huge black tip. Like, really, really prominent black fin um, uh, on this assumedly juvenile shark, uh, of milk shark, so... Uh, little, little baby milk shark being worked up. Uh, nice, uh, nice fresh individual. Um, recently just landed. It's kind of cool. This one is interesting in coloration too, because it almost looks like there's a little bit of, and I forget if this is the right word, like a cape, where it's like you have like the the gray back, and then you have like this slightly like um, weird midsection line of gray, and then like these two lines of cream uh, cream color. So it kind of looks interesting. And then just a drawing of the milk shark, but lots of lots of variation in the color on on the species. But this one, this looks a little strange, actually. I, I have a feeling this one might not be correct, and this could be a different species. So it's pretty fascinating because that that's just ridiculous. That is, that is a really prominent feature, like that black tip. So very interesting. So we'll kind of go back. Sorry, I do love this photo though, because that just, that looks so great. It's a really, really nice color on that species. Yeah, really great coloration on the shark though. Oh, cool. Um, um, I was just about to say maybe it's a juvenile thing. It could be. That's a really great guess actually, because um, Black tips are something that are found in juvenile carcharinids. Um, so we talked about this, I think, recently with uh, bull sharks have black tips when they're in the juvenile phase of life. Uh, who else has it? Um, do sandbar sharks? I forget if sandbar sharks do or don't, but I, I definitely know bull, bull sharks do. Bull sharks definitely have juvenile um, uh, black tips in their juvenile phase. So um, that's a great point. It could be that. I just think it's so... Um, Predominant that I, I I'm so curious if that if that is a thing for the juvenile phase or if that could be different. So oh, very cool. Uh, Roy, uh, uh, bronze coloration could be a phenotype for that species. Uh, very cool. Yep. So uh, speaking of phenotypes, uh, so there's like the um, phenotype and genotype, and I think they have the complete genetic makeup of this species in uh, one of the papers that we'll take a look at tonight so um, that's going to be interesting to review let's take a look at fish base let's see marine freshwater brackish benthoprogen sorry benthopelagic amphidromus interesting uh, depth range 1 to 200 meters let's see I'm just kind of scanning through this. Dorsal and anal fins with dusky or blackish edges, fins slightly darker than back. Okay. Found on continental shelves, often on sandy beaches and rarely in estuaries. Reported to enter freshwater and record seven tides from Cambodia as far upstream as the Great Lake. Interesting. Um, Great Lake of, I guess, Cambodia. So, uh, by the way, I that. Vaguely reminds me, there's been weird, weird, weird news stories, like hoax stories of sharks in the Great Lakes, and I just wanted to make the record clear. There are no sharks in the Great Lakes. Um, it's not possible because uh, 
The only way to get to the Great Lakes is through the St. Lawrence Seaway, and there's no freshwater shark that can tolerate that cold temperature um, to make it all the way up there and then go into the Great Lakes. So bull sharks could never do that. Uh, it's just too cold. It's too far north. Um, conversely, bull sharks have been found in Illinois, um, up the Mississippi. Uh, that's the furthest north they've ever been recorded is, I think, southern Illinois, but um, up the Mississippi River. But um, there's no way that a shark can live in the Great Lakes. Uh, so that's just a urban legend that um, that that got kind of popular uh, a few years ago. Um, but it, it's a it's a hoax. So just just want to say that it's like an April Fool's thing. So you know. occurs near the surface in shallow waters. Uh, feeds mo mainly on small pelagic and benthic bony fishes, also cephalopods and other vertebrates. Let's see. Uh, this is an interesting note. The 178 speci uh, centimeter specimen recorded off Africa is possibly based on some other species. That's interesting. What are they talking about? Okay, so a specimen from 1998. Um, I don't have any 1998 papers tonight, so. All right. Very cool. Let's check out Ice Your Red List um, as far as the milk shark. Actually, before we do that, I do want to shout out to um, this is kind of a cool group called the Gills Club. So uh, I forget if we featured them on the stream before, but uh, what it is, it's um, I guess I guess reading their um, mission statement would be better. The Gills Club uh, harnesses girls' passions for sharks, nature, and the environment by giving them the opportunity to engage in projects focused on making a significant impact on the way sharks are perceived by the public. So, uh, Gills Club has become kind of more and more prominent. Um, it's kind of cool to see that they are associated with things like North Carolina Aquarium, uh, which are really excellent aquariums, um, you know, and like, like, you know, the Newport Aquarium, I think, is that the one in, um, Kentucky? I could be wrong, but, um, but, uh, yeah, it's, it's a cool group. Um, and I just wanted to shout out, uh, to them because, um, they, they, it, I, I like the, mis the, the mission and I really like the message. So, and I also love the pond Gil gills club. So, but I do want to check out, they did write up a profile on the milk shark rise and the cutest. So I think it will be kind of cool to check it out. So, um, the ice and relis, this is kind of fascinating. So this was written in 2017 and the status was least concerned. Currently, it's vulnerable, but a lot of sharks um, were reassessed recently. So the vulnerable status came in 2020. So this was before the new assessment. So this was, uh, at the time, a correct snapshot of what how the shark was doing. So we thought this was the least concerned species. Um, let's see. The milk shark is a small tropical species that inhabits the shallow waters of beaches and estuaries along the coasts of Africa, Southeast Asia, and Australia. Uh, reportedly, milk sharks can travel into freshwater habitats. Uh, populations of the coast of Indonesia are genetically distinct from populations of the coast of eastern Australia. I think, uh, Minjus, did you ask a question earlier about um, whether two populations are genetically distinct? Um, I don't know if you mentioned these two regions specifically, but it's kind of cool to see that uh, there are genetically distinct populations, and uh, that's actually pretty interesting to see where... Um, we've talked about there's a lot of species of shark hiding in plain sight, and uh, it'll be cool to see how distinct these populations are um, as we look at some of the genetic studies. Uh, let's see. Da, 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 da. Uh, black tip sharks hunt milk sharks. Uh, milk sharks are viviparous, meaning they give live birth, meaning pups are nourished by placental connection during gestation. Uh, female milk sharks are pregnant for one year before giving birth to litters of one to six pups that range in length from, oh, we already read that, uh, 12, uh, 10 to 15 inches. Oh, off the coast of Oman in the Indian Ocean, milk shark litters have twice as many female pups as male pups. But off the coast of Senegal in the Atlantic, litters have the same number of male and female pups. That's fascinating. That's actually really fascinating. I, I don't know. I wonder why that is, actually. That's actually really interesting. So in a single litter in the Atlantic, you have uh, an even sex ratio, but in the Indian Ocean, 
Uh, you have more females than males. That's really interesting. Let's see. Milk sharks may be resilient to overharvesting because they are relatively fast growing, reach maturity at a small size, and produce a litter of pups every year without taking a break between reproductive cycles. So, also, I left a like. You can easily leave a like on this uh, thing. So, uh, please do if you get a chance to check out Guild's Club. So. But I was like number 11, so. Um, but produce a pupper every year without taking a break between reproductive cycles. So that's, that's actually really cool because this is something that's made Atlantic Sharpener Sharks really successful. Um, they're very fast growing as far as sharks go. So you would think that the milk sharks would be doing okay, but currently they're not. So uh, we'll read into what makes them vulnerable. Oh, <laughs> I mean, just I called it on being number 12. Awesome, awesome. Uh, Roy Roy, Great Lakes is very cold. Got in this swim when I lived in Montreal. Oh, awesome! That's 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 pretty tough. That's that's really awesome. Um, yeah, I don't know if I could do a polar bear plunge. I'm very, um, I'm usually pretty cold tolerant. Uh, I actually no, you know what? I did something like that, and it was a really dumb thing. Um, I went, I did it twice actually. Uh, I went, I tried to go snorkeling in March in a place near the mouth of the Chesapeake Bay, and it just wasn't a good idea. Um, I, I was okay, but like, um, because that's a time of year where you get wintertime animals and, you know, you don't get dangerous species of shark, I was like, well, might as well try, and I didn't really see anything. It just, there's, there's not a lot of activity that time of year, and I just got cold for nothing. Um, the worst thing I've ever did was tried snorkeling and I didn't read the weather report, and this was in May, and the water temperature here is still really cold in May. Um, it's it's not quite safe to swim. June is when it's like start starting to be safe to swim. But I went early May, I did not read the weather report, and uh, it was starting to kind of like storm a little bit. And oh my gosh, I didn't see anything in the water. I It was too murky, I was just was freezing and like, yeah, the place that I went to was like two miles away from my car, so I had to walk all the way back, you know, in like wet clothing in the middle of the storm, and like I, I almost did myself in. That was that was a really dangerous experience. So um, temperature is is not something to mess with. Um, so as far as like you know, be sure to dress warmly or have you know some source of warmth. So um, so yeah, it's gonna be a while before I do a polar bear plunge. Uh, is is my point because I. I've done I've done it for no good reason and I, I I haven't had good results from it so I will say I do miss um, in New England I did a lot of snorkeling off um, Odeon Point um, or, or uh, Rye so uh, Seaco Science Center is a really cool area um, and uh, yeah mostly Rye like mostly Rye uh, Winger Chic in Massachusetts um, these are great places where when you snorkel in the summer, like the days are really hot, but the water's just ice cold, and you get to see a lot of cool animals. But, um, like, like it, it's like you're freezing, and then you just jump back onto the beach and you warm yourself up again, and you go back in. So, like, uh, New England snorkeling is a lot of fun. I, I will say it's super fun. You, I, you get to see like lobsters and. Um, Mostly, mostly lobsters. I've seen flounders, striped bass. Uh, the coolest thing I've seen is probably like a skate, you know? Um, so, yeah. Just, sorry, random tangent, but... So, milk shark is a vulnerable species. Oh, check this out. So, it lives in the Red Sea, but it also is in this weird pocket of the Mediterranean. Look at this. So Tunisia and Italy, you can find milk sharks in Italy. Interesting. Huh, so let's figure this out. What's going on with the milk shark? Okay. Uh, the milk shark is a small shark that occurs in tropical and subtropical waters across the Indo-Pacific and Eastern Atlantic Oceans. Let's see, highly productive species that breeds annually and matures early, so that sounds good. The species is taken as target and bycatch by industrial and small scale fisheries with multiple gears, including trawl, 
Gilnet and Long Lying, and is retained for meat and fins. It is one of the most commonly consumed tropical and subtropical coastal sharks globally. Uh, the population is reported to have increased in Northwest Australia over three generation lengths and to be both stable over two years and have declined by 99% over the past three generation lengths in two years uh, of India. So Australia, it's actually growing. India, it's sharply declining. It is inferred to have declined by 6, 7, 80% in Sri Lanka over the past three generation lengths and inferred to have declined in Southeast Asia. In some other parts of its range, the milk shark is reported to have undergone a population increase, possibly due to mesopredator release. Oh, that is so cool. Oh, actually, I mean, it's really bad, but it's it's so... Okay, we've talked about this before, but I'd love to dive into it again. It's so interesting, so... Okay, so... And this is, this is, this is so cool, because this is sharp nose sharks in general. Like, Rhizoprionodon... Like, Rhizoprionodon is kind of like the winning genus in light of human pressure, in light of the Anthropocene. Because what's going on is, um, as there's fishing pressure and habitat degradation, um, it's hurting a lot of the large sharks, and we're taking a lot of large sharks, like, um, tiger sharks is not a good example, but like, um, cause that, that species seems to be doing okay, actually. Um, right? Let me, let me make sure I'm getting that right. Um, just doing a quick fact check. Galio Cerdo. Are tigers doing okay? They're near threatened. Okay, good. So they're near threatened. So they're actually, yeah, they're doing pretty okay. That's what I thought. Um, I'm trying to think of a good example of sharks that are taken out of um, habitats. So like, uh, I, I guess, I guess you could say bull sharks. I guess you could say hammerheads. Hammerheads are probably, <laughs> excuse me. Hammerheads are probably the best example because um, they, they do eat smaller, they, they do eat fish, including smaller sharks, but uh, sand tigers, actually sand tigers, you know what, sand tigers are the best example, so here we go. So if you have a, like a coral reef environment or like an environment where you take out large sharks, like, like just because of fishing, um, like you take out the top apex predators because they're, they're, they can't handle the fishing pressure. And sand tiger sharks are an excellent example of this. Um, they cannot handle fishing pressure. They reproduce really slowly. They're a critically endangered species. Um, so sand tiger sharks, also known as gray nurse sharks, this is a Carcharis taurus. It's a critically endangered species and it's being removed from its environment just because it can't, like, it's not doing well in the face of fishing pressure and human pressure. And when you take out that, or take out those top predators, um, you remove a predator for the smaller sharks uh, like these milk sharks and so the milk shark population starts growing and that's what it mean that's what meso predator release means is that um, the predator of um, the smaller shark uh, is now absent from the environment and there's now an open niche there's open space like you don't have sand tiger sharks competing for resources they're now actually slowly disappearing and so milk sharks fill that void um, this is happening with sharp nose sharks. So Atlantic sharp nose sharks um, are doing the same thing. So on the one hand, it's kind of cool where it's like if you take out a top level predator, um, its space is being filled by smaller predators. Um, and in a weird way, it's helping those smaller sharks. But ultimately, the real problem is, well, you're actually degrading the environment so much and like exuding so much fishing pressure that um, you you are effectively eliminating the large sharks to the point where it's like we may not have them in the future. Um, in the case of the sand tiger shark, that's a very real possibility. Um, I was about to say the oceanic white tip, but um, which is also critically endangered, but that's not really a shark that overlaps with the sharp nose sharks environment. Um, critically endangered sharks that do overlap, um, that I know of, are sand tiger sharks, um, the scalloped hammerhead, the great hammerhead, um, like these are large, large predatory sharks that are definitely critically endangered and are being removed from these environments and could potentially like offer, um, like their removal offers space for the smaller sharks to take over that niche, but um, it, it, it's, it's a really fascinating dynamic. Um, 
uh, the, best the best example, example not the most common example of this, is like uh, uh, when uh, in, California, in California, when you, uh, people use people use uh, sea otters, um, and sea otters are slow, slow, slow to carry, carry it, it needs uh, uh, sea urchins uh, uh, because sea otters are natural, natural, natural prey on sea urchins, and so, and so, and so sea urchin so population, population is bloated, bloated, and, and, uh, and that in turn is detrimental to kelp. Um, a um, great one for, for kind of like, like um, we have a lot of the waters in the east, east, eastern seaboard. I would say, like, um, like we have a lot of the Canada and, 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 and the eastern seaboard. Um, um, so, so like deer, like, deer. Uh, the fact that we have so many deer everywhere, a part of it is mesoprise release where we don't have wolves. Um, so the eastern part of the United States used to have wolves. Um, I believe the eastern part of the United States used to have mountain lions, and still it still does very, very, very rarely in um, like Appalachian areas. Like mountain lions, really, re this is ridiculously rare, but they do come down here. Um, it's it's extremely rare though. But wolves are the bigger thing. Um, like we used to have wolves. I th I'm pretty sure it's safe to say we used to have mountain lions, but we definitely used to have wolves, and you know. As settlement happened, and as, as human settlement happened, um, wolves became extirpated from their environment, and um, that released deer. And it's part of why we have so much deer, like because they don't have a natural predator, um, you know. So because we got rid of it. So there's a lot of examples of this happening across nature. And it's really cool to see it with sharks. Um, like it, it's one of the most fascinating and interesting dynamics I've seen or you know learned about. Um, when kind of like studying sharks, but it, it's, it's also like really concerning because it's like, wow, like we are really negatively impacting the large sharks to a very severe degree because the smaller sharks are actually starting to replace their niche. So it's pretty crazy. Um, let me, let me, uh, let's see. Um... Oh yeah, Minjus. Okay, heard rumors that were a mountain lion in Maine. So those are true, uh, and I will. I like those are actually true. Um, I, will, I will tell you why. Like, uh, I've heard rumors of mountain lions in like the Blue Ridge Mountains of Virginia, and whenever people told me those rumors, I was like, absolutely not. There's no way. There's no way they would be here. They live like in the West Coast. They they don't live here at all. Blah blah. And then. Um, I have a really great, um, a really good friend of mine, um, who's a conservation biologist at the College of William and Mary, um, uh, and I, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna say his name, like, Dr. Matthias Loy, he, he's awesome, he, he's been a really huge support of, like, Dr. Jaws, and just kind of, like, um, you know, really great conservation, he's an amazing conservationist, and, and just really, really cool, really cool person, um, and he studies a lot of different terrestrial conservation, um, like, like, terrestrial species at the center of really important conservation issues, and he actually has done some um, studies that have involved big cats, um, or has helped participate in field research uh, in which like big cats are you know, involved. Um, and he told me that <laughs> apparently big cats like the mountain lion uh, have a huge range. Like, like enormous range to the point where they actually very, very sensibly can actually access the Appalachian Trail from Canada. They're a little bit more common in Canada and then they'll actually take the trail um, because the, like, like mountain environments mimic, uh, because they're so much higher, um, you know, the temperature is a lot colder and the mountain environments mimic northern environments. So um, it's actually kind of suitable for, um, mountain lions are used to kind of like a Canadian environment where there's actually like, like in Northeastern Canada, there's areas that are like, you know, less densely populated and, um, you know, like more open for mountain lions to comfortably live. Um, mountain lions from that environment will actually go down the Appalachian trail and it's perfectly legitimate for them to do that. Like they, they apparently have that large of a natural range where if they feel like it, they could totally do it. And so the rumors of your mountain lion in Maine and then the one that I, I've heard about in Virginia are absolutely true. Like they can actually do that. It's really rare. It is like winning the lottery to see one. Um, Cause I, I would never, I don't think anyone would describe like Virginia or Maine as natural mountain lion habitat, but it is something that they can do. So, um, so yeah, like uh, there are like, I would say like those rumors are definitely true. 
uh, because the ones of Virginia, um, I've had people, see, like people I know have seen the mountain lions um, in like the Blue Ridge area. And so if they have come down this far, they had to go through, they more or less probably had to go through Maine um, as far as like, you know, that continuous line of Mount Montane habitat. So it's really cool, but uh, yeah, it's it's w very very weird thing. I always thought it was like an urban legend, and then I was I was convinced otherwise. So it's it's pretty cool. But um, let's see. Uh, it's some other okay yeah. Uh, species productivity likely produces some resilience of fishing pressure. However. The lower productivity where it is heavily exploited in West Africa is of concern. It's heavily fished throughout its range except in Australia in mostly unregulated fisheries and steep declines over the past three ge generation lengths have been reported. It's suspected the milk shark has undergone a population reduction of 39% over the past three generation lengths due to levels of exploitation and is assessed as vulnerable. So that's interesting and really concerning. Um, again, shout out to Australia. Um, there's so many sharks that we've seen on the stream where they are benefiting from Australia's like protective measurement uh, measures like uh, like protective um, fisheries regulations like there's a lot of sharks that have really benefited from Australia kind of being more um, preventative um, and, and like more like, 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 like it's cool to see that this particular species is actually growing in Australian waters um, and it's really sad to see that in other parts of the world, it's really declining. So it's kind of like this overall assessment of vulnerable is this collision of these two completely different dynamics where it's growing in Australia, but it's sharply declining in other parts of the world. So that assessment of vulnerable is, is very valid, but that's also really scary though, because, um, you know, that is a steep decline. That is a really steep population decline. Um, let's see what else we have before we look into literature. Um, here is the Austra Atlas of Living Australia. Here's the natural range in Australia. Let's see. India. Okay, here we go. Okay, the milk shark is a species of requiem shark and part of the family Carcharinidae, whose common name comes from an Indian belief that consumption of its meat promotes lactation. Got you. So the so India is so this is so India seems to be the culture that um, has the like, was the foundation for the name. So that's pretty interesting. Um, let's see what else we have. Juveniles are known to inhabit tidal pools. That's cool. Love the idea of a shark in a tide pool. And seagrass meadows. Very cool. Okay, uh, this shark can be distinguished from similar species in its range by the long furrows at the corners of its mouth and 7 to 15 large pores just above them. Interesting. It's one of the most abundant sharks within its range in Australia. Other names for the species include fish shark, gray dog shark, little blue shark, lawman's dog shark, milk dog shark, sharp nosed milk shark, ball beans, sharp nosed shark, and white eyed shark. Oh, this is cool. A 1992 phylogenetic analysis by Ga Gavin Naylor based on allozymes found that the milk shark is the most basal of the four rhizoprenodontic species examined. The extinct um, Rhizoprenodon fissuri, known from Middle Miocene deposits in southern France and Portugal, may be the same as Rhizoprenodon acutus. Very cool. So it sounds like this is like the classic foundational uh, Rhizoprenodon species, and that other Rhizoprenodon, like the um, Atlantic sharpnose shark or Caribbean sharpnose shark, so 
Rise of Prion on Terra Novi and Rise of Prion on Ups um, is that Obscurus? What, what is that one? Um, may have evolved from this species. That's going to really bother me. What's the Caribbean one called? It's actually quite a few Rise of Prion on so there's uh, like ten. Rise of Prion on Porosis. Sorry, is a Caribbean shark and a shark. So I was consulting my little pocket guide of sharks of the world uh, to figure that out. So. Very interesting. Uh, let's go back to Atlas of Living Australia. Um, oh, since 1985, there have been four occurrences tempo tempor temporally and spatially distinct of the milk shark in the central Mediterranean Sea, with a likely entry via the Strait of Gibraltar. So I guess it's really rare in the Mediterranean. Very interesting. The milk shark likely once had a contiguous distribution by way of the Tethys Sea until during the Miocene epoch, when Eastern Atlantic sharks were isolated from Indo-Pacific sharks by the collision of Asia and Africa. That's so cool. Oh man, that's so, so cool. Um, the milk shark favors... So, yeah, we, we haven't really... Can we... Yeah. We haven't really dived into that, because um, I, don't, I don't think that's ever been put so succinctly, but... It's so cool to think about, like, with the continental collision of Africa and East Asia, that's made a major rift in shark populations. So you have a... And it's, it's kind of cool. You can actually see that play on the big scale when you think of uh, bullhead sharks, like heterodontiforms. There are no bullhead sharks in the Atlantic. Uh, they don't really live here. Um, but bullhead sharks are found all over the Indo-Pacific, and so it's like, it's really cool to think about, like, wow, that actually is probably a big, something that's been driven by this Miocene epic. Uh, Wobegons, we don't have Wobegons in the Atlantic at all. Um, I'm trying to, uh, trying to see what else. Um, uh, a lot of the carpet sharks, a lot of, like, the bamboo sharks, we don't have them. Um, what else do we not have? Like those, those are the big ones I can think of. Wobegons, bullhead sharks, and um, the carpet sharks. Uh, a lot of the saw sharks, but we do have the Bahamas saw shark. Um, but it's really cool to see that, um, you know, this whole collision of Africa and Asia uh, back in the Miocene has made a major impact on today's world where the Atlantic and the Indo-Pacific are actually quite distinct as far as sharks go, um, to the point where like whole orders are just not found in certain places. So it's, it's a pretty cool concept. Um, occurring close to shore from the surf zone to a depth of 200 meters, the milk shark favors turbid water off sandy beaches and occasionally enters estuaries. In Shark Bay, Western Australia, juvenile milk sharks inhabit seagrass meadows composed of uh, these two seagrasses. <laughs> um, Okay, I'll do it. Amphi, Bolus, Antarctica, po Poseidonia, Australis. Okay. Although some sources state the species avoids low salinities, it has been reported several times for freshwater in Cambodia, as far as treen as the Tonle Sap. Uh, milk sharks can be found anywhere in the water column from the surface to the bottom. Of KwaZulu Natal, South Africa, it is, its numbers fluctuate annually with a peak in summer, suggesting some form of seasonal movement. Oh, very interesting. Um, more to say, I'm just gonna catch up on the comments. Oh, Roy, right, Roy, right. interesting comment. Do you think the species would do well in public aquaria? That's a great comment because I have never seen a sharp nose shark of any kind in an aquarium, actually. And they're very abundant. Uh, they're the, uh, the Atlantic sharp nose shark is the most abundant coastal shark in the United States. So. I wonder why, uh, it, my guess is they wouldn't do well, but I, I wonder why that is actually. Because um, when you think about the sharks that you see, at least in American aquariums, like, like, East, like Atlantic American aquariums, you see sand tigers and sandbar sharks those are the, and nurse sharks. Those are like, those are like the big three. Like nurse sharks, sand tiger sharks, sandbar sharks. Um, Sand tiger sharks are very have high sight fidelity. 
Um, so they seem to do really well in Aquaria. They are used to kind of being in... I mean, I, I don't think any tank can really hold a shark personally, but, you know, but for the name... In the sa for the sake of education, um, you know, those, comparatively, those sharks would do better because, like, sand tiger sharks have high sight fidelity. They like being in... Um, associated with like a specific shipwreck so I could see a tank being a little bit better for that species nurse sharks are very lazy uh, they're very they like to chill on the seabed at night or sorry during the daytime so in every tank I've seen them in they don't really swim so um, that kind of makes sense that they are good for aquaria sandbar sharks I can't quite figure out why they do so well in aquaria because sandbar sharks are very migratory so, but they do well. I mean, a lot of aquariums have them. Um, I've seen bonnethead sharks. I've seen black nose sharks. I've seen, I've heard of hammerheads, but I've never seen that. But I don't think I've seen or heard of uh, sharp nose sharks. And uh, that's a great question. I don't know. Um, Cause I, I don't know. I, I'm wondering if maybe they stress out more easily or maybe like I don't know I don't know like I, I have no idea that's actually a really great question so um we should we let's put a pin in that because it's like you would think it would right like you, you'd think if the sandbar shark does well and that's a that's a much larger highly migratory species why wouldn't the sandbar or why wouldn't the sharpener shark do well um, dogfish are in aquariums. I, I've never seen that, but, you know, that's fascinating. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know why, why that would be, but that's a really great question. So, because, like, and, and also since they do um, live in estuarine environments, um, I feel like they're pretty tolerant. They're pretty tough animals, so it's just like... I don't know. I like like maybe that's a great question. I, I like like I'm gonna ask like next time I talk to someone or like next time I see a study on Aquaria like shark husbandry, uh, we'll definitely have to take a look at it. Uh, the famous one is like great whites don't do an do well in aquariums, um, and like I try to think of some other common sharks. Dusky we've never seen dusky sharks in aquariums. Um, Never seen basket sharks in aquariums. Yeah. Oh, Minjus, I ever, I wonder if it's even been tried. Shark stuff is so strange because I feel like a lot of the questions are like, well, why wouldn't they have tried that? Actually, why would anyone have tried that? <laughs> yeah. So it, what it's interesting. What's interesting to me is because like the sharpener shark is so easy to attain. It, it's very, 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 very common here. The Atlantic sharpener shark is so common here that like why wouldn't you put it in an aquarium for display like uh and that suggests to me that it hasn't been successful and that maybe it just needs it's just one of those sharks that just doesn't do well in the tank like it just maybe needs that kind of like stimulus you know to like be out um and roaming i'm not really sure I, i'm really not sure because like white sharks have been like you know famously unsuccessfully uh, they, they, they can't be in an aquarium. Um, I'm not really sure why that is. So it's a great question. Um, and I, I don't really have any guesses. Um, cause like it's, I, I'm a, my, my only guess is that maybe it's a very energetic shark that probably just doesn't ha doesn't tolerate the, the enclosed life of a tank very well. Whereas maybe a sandbar shark is uh, maybe more energy conservative or something and is like maybe these are, these are guesses I don't, I don't really know actually so we'll have, to, we'll have to put a pin in that one because like that's an excellent question so uh, like that's a great question Roy Roy that's uh, in terms of like why we don't see this one in aquariums so because we think of bonnet heads excuse me Sorry, when you think of bonnet heads, which are found in aquariums, um, you know, they do pretty well. So, I don't know. Anyway. Uh, let's see. I do want to read more on this. So, identifying features of the milk shark um, are the long furrows in the corners of its mouth and the large pores above them. The largest member of its genus, so this is the largest riser on. 
Uh, it's kind of funny. It's still actually six feet. Six feet's pretty big. That's pretty big. Uh, Twenty-two kilograms, forty-nine pounds for males. Um, Seventeen kilograms, thirty-seven pounds for females. Um, though there's uncertainty regarding the species identity of these specimens. I was about to say it's kind of unusual because female sharks are larger than male sharks. So, oh. Uh, even if accepted, these figures are considered exceptional. Most individuals do not exceed 3.6 meters in length. Um, oh, there you go. Generally, females are heavier and attain a greater maximum size than males. Let's see. More descriptions. Okay. Uh, there's no remarks about a black spot on the dorsal fin, so I'm wondering if that other sh that other shark in that photo, or that shark in yeah the other shark in the fish face photo, might be a different species. So it's one of the most, if not the most, so the milk shark is one of the most, if not the most abundant nearshore shark within its range. Um, feeds mainly on benthic and uh, schooling bunny fishes, squid, octopus, cuttlefish, crabs, shrimp, gastropods. In Shark Bay, the most important prey are silverthreads, herring, smelt whitings, and wrasses. And it's the only local shark species that preys on the Waigio sea perch. Found in seagrasses, beds avoided by other sharks. Cool. Smaller sharks eat proportionally more cephalopods and crustaceans, switching to fish as they grow older. So that's actually really cool. Because again, remember that these sharks change teeth as they grow. So when they get bigger, they have the serrated teeth. So I guess like their small, smooth teeth are good for the cephalopods and crustaceans. Okay, we don't need to go into... Um, Reproduction too, too much. This is so cool though. Um, pregnant females make use of inshore nursery areas to give birth, taking advantage of warmer waters and abundant food. Known nursery areas include the Banque de Arguin National Park off Mauritania and Cleveland Bay in Harold Blight Bight off Australia. In Harold Bight, large groups of small milk sharks can be found in shallow tide pools, as well as in seagrass beds where they are sheltered from predators by dense, tall vegetation. The sharks move out of these coastal embayments when they mature. That is actually so cool. And I'm, I'm again, I'm kind of surprised that there's not footage of this species because it's just like, it, it's so common. I feel like it's the same for the Atlantic shark, but shark. It's such a common shark, but it just doesn't get a lot of attention, so. Okay. A uh, large number of milk sharks are caught commercially and sold as food. Its abundance makes it a significant component of artisanal and commercial fisheries across its range. Off northern Australia, it ranks among the most common sharks caught in trawls and comprise 2 to 6% of the annual gillnet and longline catches. Uh, the reproductive characteristics of the species suggest it is capable of standing a somewhat high level of exploitation, but not as much as the grey sharpness shark or Australian sharpness shark. Alright, so that was actually a really cool profile. So what was this? The Atlas of Living Australia. That was actually a really great profile on the species. I do want to take a look at the gallery really quick. Um, let's see if we can get any living individuals. Uh, it doesn't look like we... I mean, it's like we can and we can't, so... Oh, but this is a great shot of the teeth. Look at that. Wow, and look at the eye. Lo I love this. Look at that. 
I can't zoom in here, unfortunately. But that's a great shot of the eye. Like that just shows you exactly kind of like what you know. I like, think about like when I think of a shark's eye, just like all that energy, all that power. Like you have like this beautiful, like kind of like almost like velociraptor like pupil, and then like this bright, you know. Like, in life, it's just, like, this bright, bronzy, like, golden eye, and then, like, this, you know, like, round, um, I guess that's the cornea of the eye, if it's not the iris, so, um, it, but just, like, a shark looking at you like that, it's just so cool. Uh, great shot of the teeth. From this angle, these look like the smooth tooth form, so this could be a smaller shark. Um, what's cool is that, okay, there you go, you can see the labioferals, so that were used to identify the species right down there. And you can see that ring of pores on the upper lip, so, or the upper jaw, so, very cool. Great shot of the species. I would not want that to bite you. Even though this is a small shark, those are all little razor blades, so you would never want this to bite you. Cool. Ooh, Howard, snake eyes. Yeah, love that, love that. Uh, Roy Roy, kitty eyes. Love that as well. <laughs> um, what's kind of fun, by the way, this is so random, but I've been updating my local shark list, and I've been watching a lot of Crocodile Hunter lately. Um, and it's just, like, really fun. Um, you know, just, uh, it's really cool reading this, like, Australian, um, like Atlas of Living Australia and reading about this shark and Australian locations and I, I personally just been watching a lot of like Steve Rowan Crocodile Hunter lately um, like just it, it's it's just cool you know just like like just rest in peace Steve Rowan just huge huge fan of like what he did and just it's, it's just so cool that um, you know he put Australia a lot of like Australia's wildlife on the map in a really amazing way and it's really cool to be focusing on uh, some of these shark species that actually, you know, are part of this region. So, it's so cool. But, uh, yeah, I think we've got most of the photos, and it's already almost 10.30. I think part of me being a little bit slower on to the research is just not feeling super, super well. Um, but uh, since it is 10.30, please let me know uh, what shark you would like to do next week. Um, that's a great photo. And uh, we'll dive into what piece of literature I could find on the milk shark. That's a great photo of the milk shark. And uh, really cool eye reflection here. So very cool. Uh, these are fun. Um, so these are 3D, um, or I guess, I guess it's not a 3D scan, I think this is an actual uh, preserved chondrocranium. So you get to see the, um, uh, the orbital socket, the, um, the uh, olfactory capsule, so... And then the uh, jaws, like the upper jaw and lower jaw, so... Very cool. Okay. So, um, since it's 10 we probably won't be able to get to all of these pieces of literature, but we'll just kind of go through. I have these arranged roughly chronologically, so let's see. So I'm just going to scan through these uh, with the nice music in the background, and um, I'll just kind of shout out things that are new while also monitoring the chat for new sharks. Oh, Minja, so there's a shark from last time that was super endangered, but I'm blanking on its name. Um, I don't know if this is it, but uh, a lot of the angel sharks are critically endangered, um, so there could be that. There's also the Pondicherry shark and Lost shark. Um, those are two critically endangered carcharhinids that we have not covered yet, so... Um, could be, could be those. Let's see... Globally, the species may contain several subpopulations. The Eastern Atlantic subpopulation is geographically isolated from the remainder of the population. 
In Australian waters, the milk shark is from, from the East Coast are genetically homogenous with no evidence of fine scale stock structure. Interesting. Uh, milk shark is common in co coastal and continental shelf waters with seagrass habitats considered important to the species. So it's really cool to see um, a shark so strongly associated with seagrass. Um, I love that. Um, I love the idea of like being able to snorkel in seagrass and just see like a little shark like that. It's so cool. Um, I've snorkeled in seagrass before in Florida, and um, I've snorkeled with rays. I've scared. I've actually scared a stingray on accident, um, which is a really dumb move. I, I jumped headfirst into the water, and a stingray shot out from under me. So. Um, but um, I have not snorkeled with sharks, unfortunately, in seagrass areas, so. But, uh, let's see. But yeah, the whole idea of like the milk shark being like so seagrass um, adjacent um, or, or something that like likes to use seagrass habitats, um, it, it's really cool. Uh, the only, the equivalent I can think of here is the bonnethead shark, where uh, bonnethead sharks famously highly seagrass associated uh, nurse sharks are pretty well associated with seagrass as well. And uh, sandbar sharks, sandbar shark pups, uh, really do love seagrass environments. And um, dusky smoothhounds, those also are very, very um, strongly associated with seagrass. So. Let's see. Ooh. Um. <laughs> Uh, love that comment, Minjus. Uh, Howard, did we do the spear tube shark? Uh, did I don't know. If, I don't think we did. Let me double check that really quick. I also love that about the stream. We are now 67 episodes in. So, um, and I've uh, mistakenly done one shark. Okay, we actually did do the spear tube shark. So we actually did that. That was episode 25. So silky or spinner shark. Um, I don't think we've done either one. Uh... Ooh, okay. Yeah. Oh, that's a good toss up actually. Um, okay, so both are up for grabs. Silky shark or spinner shark. Let's see which one is in uh, more conservation need actually. So the silky shark is vulnerable. And the spinner shark is vulnerable. I will say maybe, oh, oceanic white tip. That's a good one too. Uh, this is a good toss up. Uh, oceanic white tip is critically endangered. Um, so I'm torn between the spinner or the oceanic white tip. Um, and the reason is, for the silky shark, um, I remember our good friend Jess Myers, um, she loves silky sharks, um, it's one of her favorites, so um, if Jess uh, comes back on the stream uh, for a future episode, that might be a fun one to, to save, for, save to do with her, but a spinner shark or oceanic white tip, I'd be totally down for either one. Um, Ninja spinner sounds cool. Okay, let's do the spinner shark. Um, that one is actually really fascinating because... Um, so I did a video of sharks in the Chesapeake Bay, and it had 12 sharks, and it was based on fishes of the Chesapeake Bay by a really solid marine scientist, um, including Jack Music, very famous shark researcher. And there are two species that were not really included on the list proper that, with recent studies that might be associated with climate change, um, actually are now part of the Chesapeake Bay fauna, um, all of this to say, uh, spinner shark is one of those species. So a spinner shark is actually uh, something that you can find in Chesapeake Bay, uh, which is kind of wild. So I got to update my video, unfortunately. But um, and for anybody who's watching this, white sharks can't be found in the bay. Don't ask me. <laughs> like 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 white sharks cannot be found in the bay, but spinner sharks can. So um, so that I'm per personally really really interested to learn more about them because um, when I was studying about sharks in this region. Um, you know, like I never thought that spinners could go into the bay, but with recent research um, and recent tagging by VIMS, uh, Virginia Consumer Science, 
um, they've actually caught some spinner sharks in the bay proper, which is kind of wild to think about. So, um, yeah, I'd, I'd be so down to a sp for a spinner shark. So let's do that. That is Carcarinus. And great suggestion, Howard. Uh, Carcarinus brevipinna. Uh, these are really cool. So um, famously, as the name suggests, uh, spinner sharks leap out of the water and spin in the air. A lot of sharks do that, but I don't think they do it to the degree that a spinner shark does. So um, that's going to be a lot of fun to do. So yeah, we'll do that one next week. So great selection, guys. Um, let's see. Just to save my voice, we'll just kind of keep... Um, I'm just going to read really briefly maybe not all these extracts I, I abstracts i think i might like bounce around to hone in on something that kind of might be the most interesting um and i think i think we could push it to 11 um you know like my my throat is kind of dying a little bit but like i i think we've made it this far we could totally we could totally do 11 o'clock so um so i actually yeah i guess we'll do everything in order but i might not read the whole abstract like i usually do so this one is reproduction of the milk shark uh, from the coast of Senegal. So I'm just going to shout out things that seem interesting. It's the most abundantly landed um, shark uh, along the Senegalese coast. Females had an annual reproductive cycle, although some reproduced in alternate years. In free swimming specimens, females significantly outnumbered males, especially among sub-adult and adult specimens. So that's kind of interesting. Uh, so I think this was the study that ba was the basis for uh, females outnumbering males in this species, which is so weird. Uh, it's, it's very unusual. Do I just kind of bounce ahead? Nice uh, profile on the spinner shark. So, or sorry, the my goodness, the milk shark. Let's zoom in on this because this is a nice FAO profile kind of describing the species. Okay. Uh, local names: Syke, Pishik, or Serapi Pishik. <laughs> Let's see. A small shark with a long, narrow snout, big eyes without rear notch. Long uh, upper and lower labial furrows. So there's a nice diagram of it down here. Uh, second dorsal fin smaller than the anal fin. Uh, Interdorsal ridge absent, rudimentary. Ob oblique cusp teeth with smooth or weakly serrated edges. So this must be a small individual because again, the larger milk sharks actually do get serrations on their edges. So a very cool, nice diagram of the teeth. Okay. Bouncing ahead. Slow growth of the overexploited milk shark affects the sustainability in West Africa. This is kind of interesting. So I might read the whole thing here if I can. Okay. Uh, this is by A. Ba, K. Diof, F. Gui Haman, and J. Panfili. Uh, age and growth of the milk shark were estimated from vertebral age brands from December 2009 to November 2010. Uh, for, over 400 milk sharks uh, were sampled along the Senegalese coast. Let's see. The results suggest that the milk shark is a slow growing species, which renders species particularly vulnerable to heavy, fish heavy fisheries exploitation. The growth parameters estimated in the study were crucial for stock assessments and for demographic analysis to evaluate the sustainability of commercial harvests. Oh, this is a really cool cross-section of a shark vertebrae. So, um, if, if you can imagine, um, if I had a shark vertebrae and if I just set it down on its side and I sliced into it, this is what it would look like. It would make this like really perfect V shape. So like 
um, the notochord uh, would go through this hole right here, so in this direction, in a vertical direction. So, um, yeah, that's actually really crazy. And you can see the growth ring. So this is, this is the classic method of aging sharks, but it's controversial because um, people assume that um, there's mineral deposits in these growth rings every year, but in some parts of the world that might not be accurate. Um, so it really depends on the species. So let me zoom in uh, for a better look. So this is a really this is our best cross section of what a shark vertebrae looks like actually, and what the whole growth ring method of aging looks like. So you actually cut into vertebrae like this. Um, and I remember when I used to work at um, Vim's, uh, there would be like bags of shark vertebrae, um, you know, that were. Uh, they had the species name on them and they're used for studies just like this where you would actually have to like dissect them like cut into them and then carefully look under microscope what the pattern of the growth rings are to help establish how old they are uh like um how old the species is or sorry how old that specimen is so but again it's a controversial method it, well not controversial but it's like a a highly debated method because Relevant questions are like, are these rings deposited every year or are they deposited every like, you know, two years or every half a year, depending on nutrients. So it really depends. So. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that, guys. Take it easy. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, I'm glad I'm glad we're going to do we're going to do. Um, uh, Eleven. Uh, I'm, 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 I'm glad we're going to do that. Also, it was kind of fun, by the way, I don't know if the music's coming through really well, but um, this is kind of like a fun collection of Nintendo aquatic-ish music. And so what's kind of funny is like some of it's distracting me because it's like, it sounds so familiar. And I, I um, this is part of my back of my brain is like, what, what game is that from? So this one is from, this one is actually maybe Pokemon actually. The one that we're listening to right now. And we heard uh, Metroid earlier, so it's kind of fun. But... Okay, population genetics of four heavily exploited shark species around the Arabian Peninsula. So there we go. The Northwest Indian Ocean harbors a number of larger marine vertebra, uh, vertebrae taxa that warrant the investigation of genetic population structure given remarkable spatial heterogeneity in biological characteristics, such as distribution, behavior, and morphology. Here we investigate the genetic population structure of four commercially exploited shark species with different biological characteristics. The black tip shark. Ooh, Carcharinosaura. I don't know what that one is. Um, the milk shark and then the scalped hammerhead between the Red Sea and all of the water bodies surrounding the Arabian Peninsula. Just look up where Carcharinosaura is. Our analysis indicates that in smaller, smaller and less vast shark species, species there are no contemporary barriers, gene flow across the study region, regional historical events, for example. Place the same glacial cycles may have affected connectivity in the spot tail shark and the milk shark. Interesting. Uh, a proximity network analysis provided evidence that Arabian hammerhead sharks, uh, scalped hammerheads, may represent a population segment that is distinct from other known stocks in the Indian Ocean, raising a new layer of conservation concern. That's actually terrifying. That's actually horrifying. Like, like the scalped hammerhead is a critically endangered shark, and to, to think that there may be a different genetically distinct subset of scalped hammerhead in the Red Sea, that's actually terrifying. Man. Our results call for urgent regional cooperation to ensure the sustainable exploitation of sharks in the Arabian region. Now, this is a really cool study. Who are the authors? This is Julia L. Y. Spite, Rima W. Jabato. Um, Jabato uh, sounds very familiar, actually. Aaron C. Henderson, Alec 
B. M. Moore and Michael L. Berumen. Yeah, Berumen. kind of scrolling ahead to the figures because I know we're getting close to 11. Oh. Nope. Yeah, these are cool studies. Don't have time to really break it down, but... Okay. Yeah. We'll move on, but that that's actually really cool, the idea that the hammerheads in the Red Sea actually might be genetically kind of distinct from other ones, which is, again, really terrifying. Um, the other thing that's really cool is that Pleistocene glacial cycles may have affected connectivity in the milk in milk shark populations. That's actually pretty interesting to think about. It's so cool to see how the change in the planet influences species. Like I know that's all of evolution across all animals, but. Um, it's kind of fun. The milk shark, like, inadvertently has, like, really brought that concept forth uh, twice now tonight, where it's like, you know, how the continents have moved or how the planet has changed has affected how sharks have evolved, and it's just, it's really cool. Let's see. Feeding habits of the milk shark in the Gujarat coastal water waters of northeastern Arabian Sea. Let's see. Okay. Uh, the shark foraged on diversified prey items which were pulled into four distinct groups. For example, teleos, which are fish, crustaceans, mollusks, and annelids, which are marine worms. Uh, fish were found to be the preferred food item followed by crustaceans. Uh, mollusks and annelids, which are marine worms, con 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 constituted, sorry, the accidental or accessory food items. The species of the pelagic predator probably performs vertical movements in search of prey items. The shark also showed some sorts of preference and selectivity for clopeids, which are herring, and granulids and caragnids. Um, I'm not sure what these. T oh no, caragnid. Caragnids are jacks, I think. I'm not really sure what granulids are. Let's see what that is really quick. I'm glad I have a, a phone, which is like a mini computer. It's very useful sometimes. Cragulid. Anchovies. Okay, so it eats uh, herring, anchovies. Okay, very cool. And I just want to make sure, I'm pretty sure Kerangids are jacks, but I want to make sure I got that right. Jacks, pompnos, jack mackerels, and runners. Got you. Okay, very cool. It's a great group of fish. Um, actually, clupeids in, in general, so the herrings, fantastic shark food. Like, herrings and mullets, excellent shark food. Um, lots of sharks love herring and mullet. Uh, preference for prey items was not found to be significantly different between the females and males. Um, juveniles were found to have significantly higher, I'm not sure what I or F is, and comparatively higher velocity index than that of the adults, whereas the mean preys per stomach were found to be lower than that of the adults. Uh, moreover, the prey preference was also significantly different between the juveniles and adults. Again, that's really cool because juveniles and adults have different kinds of teeth, so they are best adapted for different kinds of prey items. It's so cool. Uh, the study provides necessary baseline information about the feeding habits of the shark in the region, which will be helpful in understanding the trophodynamics of the species under the influence of overfishing and climate change. So, uh, I'm loving, by the way, kind of a sidebar, more and more I am seeing climate change in shark literature, uh, which is really cool because I think mid 
tens, I started getting questions about shark climate change and um, or how climate change affects sharks. And around the mid tens, I wasn't really seeing a lot, you know. Um, and then I feel like after the mid tens, it's getting more and more focus, which is really important and really cool to see. Um, and I feel like climate change has been applied to other groups of animals or other groups of wildlife. Um, whales being a really big example, um, or coral, uh, coral and whales being huge examples. Um, but it's really cool to see that now sharks are starting to get um, some forms of address in, in light of climate change. So, excuse me. Um, corals, I'm pretty sure everybody knows, uh, but just in case, like the big thing is that higher water temperature is stressing the corals out and it's making them bleach um, for a complicated process which releases the algae in the corals, the zooxanthellae. Um, so that's kind of like the big climate change subject for them. And then for whales, uh, the big climate change subject is how the warming waters affect the distribution of krill and in turn affects the distribution of whales. Uh, there's a lot of krill populations that are getting, trying to get closer and closer to Antarctica, and therefore they're bringing the whales closer and closer to Antarctica um, it, because like, they're trying to get into the cold water that they like and with warming temperature, they're, they're, fi they're having less and less place to do that, so. But anyway, um, this, is, this is a nice little study. Um, and I should say little, but it's like this is a, this is a nice study, kind of analyzing the um, diet of this species. So here's an identification card of the sharpness shark, or sorry, the milk shark. It, it is a kind of sharpness shark, but the milk shark. And then before I get too carried away, um, I just want to catch up on the comments. So. Uh, Howard, uh, Shark's Greatest Challenge will be f surviving us. Yep, yep, that, uh, absolutely. Uh, the Anthropocene, um, you know, which I really like that term. Um, oh, shark, yep, there we go, actually, yeah. Sharks have endured five mass extinctions, let alone climate change. Um, yeah, so, like, the Anthropocene also um, attributed to, like, the sixth mass extinction. You know, it's... Uh, it is, uh, like, like I, I really appreciate that, and, um, you know, it is, like, the greatest challenge uh, for them. Um, I'm confident that sharks as a whole will live, um, that we will always have a world with sharks, and I do believe that if you think of all of sharkdom and all the sharks in the world, and, and especially, like, ones that live in deep water or the ones that are, like, very highly adaptable, like these sharpnose sharks, sharks um, not really the milk shark, but definitely the Atlantic sharpnose shark, like that are taking over some of these niches. I definitely think sharks would outlast humanity, like for sure. Um, but the big question is which sharks? Um, so like I'm not worried about sharks in general, like like we're sharks at a whole, like like sharks at a whole will be fine, and like we will always have a world with sharks, which I really love. Um, but the very concerning question is, are we going to have a world with all of the shark species, or are we going to lose some? And I think the uh, terrifying uh, truth is, like, we really could lose some, and, like, we may have lost some already, which is why we have, like, things like the lost shark or the Pondicherry shark. Um, these are two sharks that have not been seen in a very long time, but it's so hard to predict, like... Are they still here? Are they extinct, technically? Like, as of today, as of right now, in 2024, there is no extinct shark from modern extinction, from modern human impact extinction. We have not driven a shark to extinction yet, uh, officially, but we are getting really close. Um, so we'll see. I mean, you know, we have um, increasing awareness, which I really appreciate. Um, I do appreciate that. There are some sharks that are critically endangered that are very popular, like the hammerheads are a great example. They're critically endangered. Um, Makos really deserve more attention because Mako sharks really should not be fished, to be honest, um, and, and they're not doing so well. Um, the, uh, oh, Howard, good point that we know of, that we know of. That's a really good point. Um, there can be species that 
may have already faced extinction that we didn't really classify correctly um, or didn't really like have a chance to classify. So that is an excellent point. Um, so um, I think, and I think like the species, if we did have sharks that went, went extinct, if we did have sharks that went extinct, it would be the endemic species that are very small and don't really have refuge at depth. So these would be like, um, like, like the Pondicherry shark and the lost shark. Um, when you think of fish extinction, because we've actually have had fish extinction, we've had fish species go extinct. A lot of them are river fish. Um, a lot of them are like fishes found in highly specific like river habitats throughout the world. Um, and it's just that with human population pressure, um, you know, they, they just didn't really have a chance. Whereas sharks, fortunately, um, not a lot of them are really bound to fresh water. Like they actually have such a large range for the most part. Um, so most of them, uh, most like we broke it down last week, like half of them are doing okay. Half of them have some kind of threat. Um, oh, the Chinese paddlefish, interesting. Um, you might be right. I'm actually not sure because uh, I, I haven't heard that one. But let me look that up. Chinese paddlefish. Wow. Oh my gosh. That's that's tragic. Wow. Uh, when did it go extinct? Declared extinct in 2022. Oh, that that's a shame. That, that that's a beautiful fish. Um, we have an American paddlefish, uh, in the mountains here, um, uh, which I've, I've never seen, but, um, oh, whoa, it was the only species in the genus Cephyrus and one of the two recent species of paddlefish, the other being the American paddlefish. Oh my gosh. Let's see, the American paddlefish is vulnerable, so that's crazy. Wow. Yeah. So that is really sad. So, yeah. Oh yeah, Minjus, yeah, luckily we do have the American one. So I, yeah, I just checked it. American one is vulnerable, but but it is it is really sad. Um, you know, it, it's like all extinction events, like they're heartbreaking. And it's just like, you know, I, I've never, we, we have, we're very close to some shark extinction, but, um, you know, I'm grateful that it hasn't happened yet, but I'm not, as far as like the prospect, I'm not very optimistic for things like the Pondicherry shark or the lost shark, um, or Howard made a very good point. There could have been a shark that went extinct that we just don't know of. And I'm, I'm thinking of a small coastal shark in areas that just weren't highly regulated or, or just like, or just basically have no protection whatsoever. So, um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's, you know, I'm glad that at least half of the sharks in the world currently, like, and that's over 250 species, are okay. Um, I'm glad that they're doing okay, and I'm very confident that we will always have a world of sharks, no matter what. Um, you know, but, like, you know, when you think of just what that world will look like, it's just, it's going to be interesting to see how the ocean will shift with, um, oh yeah, <laughs> I'm sorry, with the super cheery music, yeah. Yeah, it, it is really worrying to think about because like I, I, I think it is possible to see a shark extinction in my lifetime. I think it is going to happen. Um, and I'm not sure which, like, I think it's one of those two small carcharinids is probably the most likely target. Um, the reason being is that uh, when you think of all the critically endangered sharks, uh, hammerheads are getting attention, which is good. They are listed on sites appendix two. They are in areas that do have some good protection measures, like the like Australia, like you know, has some good conservation measures. The United States is really weird about hammerheads because the United States doesn't seem very quick to protect them, which is a little odd because they are critically endangered, but. Um, but there is awareness of hammerheads being a critically native species. Um, like, so the big ones, I, I think are going to be okay. The smaller hammerheads, like the less well-known ones, like the scalloped bonnet head or like the small eye hammerhead, um, those, or the scoop head shark, those are, uh, in those are in trouble. 
Um, and there, those are in areas of the world where there's some awareness of conservation, but then there's also so much pressure to not conserve them. Um, angel sharks are critically endangered, but I feel like there's a lot of focus on the Mediterranean being an, an area that has so much critical and da- critically endangered sharks and critically endangered species that um, I hope that galvanizes um, more awareness and, and more protection. I believe some of those angel sharks are protected. So so if I had to pick, it's probably going to be the lost shark or the pondicherry shark. So these are sharks in the Indo-Pacific that there's just not a lot of like awareness or, or, or like... Uh, there, there's, there's a lot of unregulated fisheries in some areas of its range where it's just like, yeah, I don't know. So my guess is it's one of those two, uh, personally. So, um, and those will be good. I, I definitely want to do one of those sharks uh, or both of those sharks this year. I think that'd be really great to do. Um, the Pondicherry shark and the lost shark. Um, I think those would be excellent spe- uh, species to cover, um, you know, just, just to kind of review what's kind of happening with them. It's a depressing subject, but, um, uh, Howard then the bonnethead is the most evolved the hammerheads yeah it really really broke my heart uh, two years ago I think when the when the bonnethead screened at Tiburno Tiburo which is like the classic bonnethead shark is it's an endangered species now which blew my mind I used to be least concerned but uh, that is now an endangered species so um, but I think I think bonnetheads are ultimately going to be okay um, it's just those other two small sharks that I'm not as confident about so uh, so we'll definitely have to cover them this year. But, um, but, you know, the nice thing is, like, we are taking a look at them, uh, we are, there is more awareness, there's more access to information than there ever has been before, and, you know, the nice thing about sharks is that because they are charismatic megafauna, they're very easy to generate interest in compared to the fish that have gone extinct, like paddlefish, you know, or like the minnows that have gone extinct, um, you know, those those don't get as much immediate support as a shark. Like it's hard to really like, you know, generate interest for, for those, um, you know, those kinds of fish. And it frustrates a lot of marine biologists, to be honest, where it's like, you know, there's these beautiful fish that they care about. Um, but it's like for the general public, they don't really hold as much sway as sharks do. Um, so that's one thing that sharks have going for them. And it's something that it's shared with whales, like sharks and whales, very charismatic, very easy to galvanize support for, and they already have strong platforms already. So, you know, I think it's great that we are spreading more awareness about them, because whales famously have had have been the the spearhead for so many great conservation efforts. Like, wh- like everybody pretty much knows that like whales are just, you know, super protected, and like you know, there's so many, there's so much consideration for them now. Um, at least in the United States, there's so much consideration for whales as far as like. Uh, but I think it's so far reaching as far as um, you really have to, you know, you can't go up to them. You have to say X amount of uh, yards away from them. Um, movies like Free Willy uh, really generated so much like popular interest in whales. Um, so for sharks, uh, you know, things like as much as Shark Week irritates me, like it's been in a lot of ways beneficial for them. Or things like Blue Planet, or you know, just more. There's, there's so many documentaries on them, and there's so much focus on them that, you know, I'm glad the eye is on is increasingly becoming on them or coming onto them, and it's just like they're like coming onto them. Sorry, the eye is increasingly on them. So, um, and the nice thing is with um, you know, kind of like our community, you know, we're bringing attention to the lesser known sharks. So. You know, we're giving every species a chance, so we're not just, like, looking at the, the, the showstopper sharks, like the great white or the tiger shark or something. You know, we get a chance to look at, um, you know, smaller or less known species um, across all the orders. So um, that's something I really, really appreciate about our community. So, um, but, uh, yeah, so, but anyway, it is um, already 11, so I'm probably going to wrap up for tonight. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's Monday and like you know I'm a little little sick, which is the allergy stuff. So that's that was a Monday Monday ridiculous like blah <laughs> word vomit. So yeah. Oh Howard, uh, save the whales. Sharks need something to eat. Yeah. Um, by the way, uh, when we talk about dusky sharks at some point, um, I remember reading a long time ago that dusky sharks coordinate attacks on whales. 
and I forget where I read that, but one day we have to do the Dusky Shark, um, you know, because I definitely want to check up on that because that is the coolest thing ever. That's like sea wolves. That is the coolest thing ever. I'm pretty sure I've heard of Dusky Sharks going after whales, like, like, tag, like, like, like in a coordinated effort, but um, we'll have to verify that someday, so... But thank you guys so much for watching. I'm really glad um, you guys were here. And I appreciate the support for tonight because, like, yeah, yeah, I mean, just the allergies are making you go insane. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, no, I, I like, this it, the, This whole weekend has been kind of rough. Um, just, it's, uh, you know, I, if anyone's had allergies before, like, it's, it sounds so dorky, but it's it's so, it's so real. It's, it's like, I, it, it's hard to, like, do anything, really, so... But I appreciate you guys being here. Uh, you guys absolutely make it worth it. And it's so much fun to uh, go through the sharks together with you. Um, and honestly, it just it just makes my Monday every time every time we uh, come on the stream together. So thank you guys. This is so, so cool. Uh, and I'm really glad we learned more about the milk shark. And then um, my favorite thing about tonight just really was like kind of learning, kind of seeing in a succinct way the big continental movements that have impacted shark evolution in general. I just think it's really cool. But... Oh, thank you, Howard. Thank you. Um, I appreciate that. So, um, hope you guys have a great rest of your week, and uh, we'll reconvene next week for. Oh, thank you, Minjus. I appreciate that. Thank you, guys. I, I appreciate that. I, I, I should be, I should be on the men soon. I, I, I hope by next week we're gonna be back to just like you know, normal voice and stuff. So, but anyway, uh, we'll cover the spinner shark next week. I'm super excited for that species. Uh, we should get a lot of footage of that, so that'll be a fun one to do. But. Hope you guys have a great rest of your week, and thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time. Cheers, guys. <laughs>